Welcome to our 11th GGW Sharks. So far, we calculated how many uh, connections with investors we've done, and it was almost 100 of uh, intros requested by investors after this pitch events. This is amazing. I'm so excited about that. And I know that a few companies are right now going through due diligence with a few of the investors. So that's for us uh, something we're really proud of th that we've managed to do together with you for this very short period of time. We have launched this program three months ago and it became viral because of your interest, because uh, of investors participating here. And I'm so grateful for your participation today. We're going to do it every week as we planned, every Thursday uh, uh, of uh, uh, every week, and except for the uh, second week of each month, where we have your record joining us once a month, uh, every Friday. So every second week of the month, we have it on Fridays. And because uh, GoGoBo World is the organizer, sponsor, and uh, the one who uh, actually leads this uh, uh, show. I'm going to show you a few slides for one minute or so, hopefully fast, and uh, then we'll kick off right away. I'll let investors present themselves and we'll pick projects one by one. Now, Google World is the digital Silicon Valley. That's what we are trying to build. That's what we are. Um, this is the platform and, and set of tools and app to let you get access to knowledge of how to start scale a company, access to network and access to opportunity to fundraise like today's event. But for investors, we give access to the deal flow, pre-qualification of uh, startups in on our app and uh, their external traffic and access to other investors, to co-invest, to find LPs and uh, uh, offer their deals. Now, uh, this is the app that we have right now this is in beta but it's already running and we already have matches with investors and startups and advisors this is looking like matchmaking but it's for business and we are make, making connections exactly like you are looking for laser focused connections by your criteria complex filters and only people you're looking for uh, and uh, the idea behind it is to save time for you and for investors now we, say we have other set of tools helping you fundraise and uh, we have pitch to global investors program which we run every three months or so and uh, uh, this is where we screen score startups this is our uh, network of investors and uh, we also have great network of advisors so it's just very quick snapshot of investors and advisors we have a lot a lot more and we bring them based on the criteria or that investors looking specific startups and startups needed specific investors so we, we want to make sure you have a good match now this is our startup alumnus who managed to raise from 500 to 10 million we are proud of them and we are looking forward to help more founders with that but it's on your shoulders you just bring it to the right people give you the environment you are the ones who race, not us, you. And um, of course, before you get uh, funded, you still need a lot of help. And that's why we partner with the best companies around the world. And they give us discounts. We have, we have about 3,000 uh, companies already working with us. And these uh, guys are giving us huge discounts. And we give it to you so you can in increase your runway and uh, achieve results fast and show traction to your investors. And uh, more than that, we help with other things to startups. We incorporate, we do taxes, accounting, and so much more. Check it out on our website. And I'm getting right to the event right now. And it's always a struggle for you how to do an elevator pitch. And uh, I've made an example on YouTube for you so you can convince the investors that you see today and as investors with very short to minute elevator pitch, how to do that, what to say. So I'm trying to give you an example. You can criticize me, but this is how I see it. And hopefully it will help you to get a deal from the investors. And uh, now let's get uh, to the beginning of DGW Sharks 11 event. Today, we have an amazing panel of uh, investors. We have Durant uh, Davis, as usually he joins almost, I mean, every actually uh, pitch event. Jordan Wildbeck, uh, 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 Bill Reichert, Matthew Stokey uh, and Michael Benerza. He is uh, here, and uh, once I see him, I'll add him to the room. Um, and uh, so use this opportunity con to convince this amazing panel of investors to get the meeting with them. If they say they're interested to talk to you during your pitch, I will connect you after the event via email because investors requested that. 
uh, but don't push them because uh, it's, it might be too much. Uh, the rules. This is something super important to make this event very well organized and simple uh, so uh, you guys get uh, what you want to achieve here. Please keep yourself muted all the time except for investors. Those who want to pitch, please raise your hand and you will get two minutes to pitch uh, uh, your project without slides. It's an elevator pitch and then you will get questions from investors. You may not get in questions to investors. They are deciding if they you are interested to them or not. Don't get upset about that. They may give you hard feedback. Take, don't take it personal. Uh, uh, be smart and actually try to change. This is your opportunity to get real feedback. Now, um, it's only for new startups uh, uh, with sales, IP, and scalable business model. If by any chance you are a repeating, uh, for, uh, you you are pitching this uh, your startup again. You need to explain what has changed for the past period you uh, pitched last time. We want to let people pitch, uh, those who never pitch. So we are going to give opportunity to new startups. But if you have some significant changes, we will let you pitch. We don't uh, have all enough resources to track if you pitched before or not, because we have a lot of startups. But please make sure that you fit our criteria, sales, IP, scalable business model, and uh, didn't pitch before. Please respect time. Uh, you have two minutes, no more. It will be a, a hard stop after this. So it's a two hours event and we will have a hard stop in uh, two hours. And even though uh, it's two hours, we will probably finish 10 minutes before to let investors uh, close the session. And those who are already a paid member of Google World or you have a, uh, a, a, you are approved on our GGW matching app, that I will send the link in the chat in a second you will have an opportunity to pitch among the first uh, so go and register create your profiles if you approve you will be considered as a verified and then this is why we'll get uh, we'll let you speak first among others and uh, don't forget this is um, uh, uh, this is your time uh, 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 to network so please network in the chats exchange contacts and um, if you don't get time to pitch, we will let you pitch on the next event. Don't worry about that. Uh, we understand that you spend your time and we give everyone an equal opportunity. That's important. So we will track everyone who didn't pitch and just email us and we'll make sure you pitch among the first and the next. Event. And finally, it's a two minute elevator pitch. Keep it as a story. Get to the point what you do. Why are you unique? Uh, tell investors about your traction. And what has significantly changed if you pitch again? And remember, by helping others, you help your own startup. So when you network in the chat, don't sell anything to each other. Try to be helpful. Try to support each other. This is why we exist. OK, so that's it on my end. I uh, hope was, it was not too long. And let's uh, introduce our investors. Uh, let's start with Durand, then Bill, then Jordan, and Matthew. Hi, everyone. Am I audible, Daniel? Yeah. Daniel, I have my AirPods on. OK, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Duran Davis. I'm a 36-year-old entrepreneur slash angel investor slash venture capitalist. I, I love talking to startups. I'm interested in investing in startups. And this event is incredible. Thanks to all of the panelists that join every week with, with constant dedication. And I want to see this thing scale out. It can go from an online to an offline experience as well. So great, preferably some, some good startups in here. Thank you, great having you here. And thank you for being every uh, uh, event on our show. Bill, your turn. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, Daniel, appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and looking forward to meeting a few of the entrepreneurs here today. <clears throat> my name is Bill Reichert and I'm a partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures. Pegasus is a global venture capital firm with over $2 billion of assets under management. We have our headquarters here in Silicon Valley and we have offices around the world. We invest pretty much across all technologies, all sectors and all stages. Primarily we're looking for companies where we can bring our network of over 30 multinational corporations to bear to help out our portfolio companies and vice versa to help accelerate our partners corporate innovation. So I started out as an entrepreneur. I was a serial entrepreneur, took two companies public before I started Garage Technology Ventures with Guy Kawasaki to be um, 
a different kind of venture capital firm back in the day. Um, and then more recently, several years ago, we merged with Pegasus Tech Ventures to, to have a global platform for reaching out and funding companies. Thank you so much. Great to have you, Bill. And uh, by the way, uh, we use Guy Kawasaki pitch deck structure as an example to build our pitch deck. And yeah, it's, it's global known now. Nowadays. Um, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see how many of the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, uh, align with that. But keep going. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, your turn. Hello, I'm Jordan Wabe with Silicon Valley Venture Group. Very pleased to be with Bill. Uh, Bill is another troublemaker, Duran. So it's not just you. Trust me on that one. <laughs> and he and, and Gary Fowler have, have churned the world around me. So I've learned a lot from uh, Gary Fowler and Bill and others. Uh, gentlemen, yeah. ladies, Call. I am Jordan Wabi with Silicon Valley Venture Group, also partner with Network VC. Uh, we invest in early stage companies, pre-series A and series A. I see my good friend John Lee with Loopy here. There you go, John. Um, we like companies that improve the human condition. So no TikTok, no twerking apps, no cannabis, no uh, online betting or gaming or esports. We want to do things that make humanity better by virtue of the outcome of what they produce. We want to do good and we want to do well. Um, if you're pitching today, good luck to you. Uh, just be focused on one thing. What do you want to get out of the three minutes with this panel? You want an introduction, you want feedback, you want a connection, you want recognition. And I suspect most of you want exposure. But focus on one or two goals. You cannot get it all done in three minutes. Good luck to you. Thank you. Well said. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, great to have you in here. Uh, Matthew, you uh, want to say a few words about what you do? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm an early stage uh, venture investor. Um, I'm industry agnostic and location agnostic. I invest all over the globe in all different sectors. Uh, I have a special affinity for the frontier and deep tech. So, you know, space, AI, anything that's upcoming over the next, uh, you know, few years that is going to be, you know, really big. So thank you to all the people here and uh, good luck. And I am looking forward to kind of hearing all your pitches. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Matthew. Great to have you in here. Um, unfortunately, your camera is not working today. Uh, maybe you fix it next time, but uh, uh, great to have all the judges in here. So uh, long story short, uh, we're going to begin right now. So guys, please raise your hands that those who want to pitch uh, and uh, those who are already on our app and approved, I put the link here in the chat, you will be pitching among the first because it will be considered you're verified. And uh, the first uh, person is pitching today is um, James O'Connor. Uh, you have two minutes, are you ready, James? Yes, I didn't think I was first, so I had to get off mute, thank you. All right, go for it. Hi. Okay. Hi, I'm James O'Connor. I am the CEO and founder of Innovation Within. And our mission is to accelerate innovation to help solve the obstacles that prevent humanity from being prosperous, peaceful, and sustainable. Our solution lies in the emerging space of customer discovery. And our SaaS platform called Discovery helps innovators de-risk new ideas by developing and validating their business models with customer discovery. <clears throat> this enables them to find product market fit quickly and become investable. We've already received Steve funding, uh, seed funding from Steve Blank and a grant from the NSF to pursue this, which we quickly built an MVP and landed the NSF as our first customer. Then we started working with academic institutions in the United States and Canada and other countries and started working with prestigious accelerators like Alchemist X and others. But that's not all. We just broke into the enterprise space with Atrium Health and Micron, one of the world's largest semiconductor companies. They used us and our services to take employee teams that came up with new ideas through this process of customer discovery to validate these new ideas and generate the uh, business models that would work. We're now seeking $2 million to scale up development, biz dev and marketing and sales so we could support these new markets and create a category in the innovation management space that leading companies will depend upon to be leaders of innovation. We also believe that the rich qualitative data that's housed in our platform is extremely valuable asset to these customer-centric companies desiring to make evidence-based decisions. 
With our platform, companies can find product market fit quickly, become investable, and accelerate innovation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and the questions? Yeah. So, go ahead. No, go ahead, Bill. You caught it before me. No, no, I caught. So, yeah. So, James. Um, <clears throat> so, all we, all that I heard about what you're doing, is somehow have some sort of platform, tool, technology, database for for doing customer discovery. Um, it's hard to it's hard to get a sense of how this is actually a protectable technology versus um, you know a social impact opportunity. Um, you know, love the idea, but could you clarify what it is that you've got that is a secret sauce that is not easily replicable? So. The magic behind our system is that it's based on the scientific process and it takes people through this process of forming a hypothesis, doing customer discovery, using the insights they gain from that to validate their business model. And uh, the secret sauces that we use speech to text to transcribe and analyze these conversations. And we're now working on AI to help them generate business model ideas come up with good questions, synthesize the insights from customer discovery and help them actually do this whole cycle of following the scientific process to actually um, innovate faster. Okay, it sounds kind of like a book yeah. rather than a, you know, rather than a, a, a business, but I'm sorry, Duran, go ahead. Yeah, so, so Mr. O'Connor, the, so you mentioned Steve Blank and a lot of the, the lean methodologies that him and Eric Rice worked on kind of drove the minimum viable product evolution inside of the startup ecosystem. However, a, a few things that were omitted inside of there is, are the sociological effects of entrepreneurs. And great, you can figure out the scientific method and how to apply this, this data to looking at metrics and say, hey, this is a good financial model. This is a sensitivity analysis. If, they, if these metrics are hit, time after time, this is what we can get. But the one thing you can't quantify if a founder's mothers die, and, and, and if, if another co-founder lose, lose, lose a brother, like I didn't hear anything about that. And that's before we get to the business side because Bill kind of hit it on that. But how does your technology really quantify the uncertainty of the human experience? Wow, <laughs> uh, that's a really good question, Durant. Um, I mean, I, I had thought about uh, how I can know if a founder's you know, dies or something like that. More than anything, what we're what we're trying to help is that most founders, most of the people that will pitch today, um, haven't found product market fit because they don't really understand their customers. And our software, the real goal is to help these founders go out, talk to customers, understand them deeply. Once you do that, you start to know how to solve their problems better than they do themselves because you understand them on a much larger scale. So in a lot of ways, I think of this process as an experiential process that actually makes founders do this due diligence so that when they talk to you, they actually have an understanding of their market deeply and it's caused them to iterate over their business model. I mean, I, I mean, I think so go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Keep going, Dwayne. No, no, go, go, go ahead, Bill, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I, I think the, the principles you're talking about make a ton of sense. Um, it just, again, I'm trying to figure out how you turn it into a business versus you know, interesting question. I mean, Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad. I I actually don't know if you pay for it. I'm can, I'm not sure. I mean, I, but the principles of you know the Lean Launchpad and the Business Model Canvas and all those tools are very valuable, extremely valuable. Um, but they're not businesses. Um, how do you turn something like that from being a valuable tool for educational and developmental purposes into an actual business? That's a great question. So at the core, you're right, this is a methodology, right? But most people don't actually do it. And the reason is, is there's no tools because these tools require a workflow flow. For example, in our platform, we have a business model canvas wow. and it's connected to customer discovery and all the insights get connected to the hypothesis. So you can actually see for everything you're going through and its entire history, why you've made decisions, what the customer said that relates to that. So um, what I found is most people will do this in separate different, uh, separate apps 
and they don't do it in a rigorous way. And so that's why Micron, for example, and these healthcare companies hired us because they're trying to do innovation in so many different directions, even something like is to simplify a 15 step process or some disruptive collaboration they're doing with the university, et cetera. So accelerators use this for this very same reason. As far as the business model, I don't think corporations have a way to do this right now. They don't. They they uh, um, it just doesn't get done. And because of that, I just don't think that the acceleration of innovation is happening because these people essentially don't understand their business models and their customers well enough to build something quickly that works. Yeah. Mm. All right. So last question for me. Oh, yeah. Something, Jordan. Go ahead. I see you, sir. Yeah, so I'll just make a quick suggestion. I would be interested if you were to, you and your team, because I'm, I'm interested in this stuff on the academic side, to Bill's point, but I'm not just sure exactly if there is a business that can be extrapolated. But I would say as a suggestion, perhaps you can build some type of a rubric around, hey, this is what happened to Mark Zuckerberg when El Vrado sued him. This is what happened to Evan Spiegel when his co-founder went away. So any event that you suffer a lawsuit, here's the percent chances of you being successful. Any event that you depart your startup within three years and you're the sole founder, this is the per percentage chance of being successful. Something on the sociological side, outside of just the academia, because it's so much information that people can utilize to ensure that they balance their accounts correctly, but it's not a lot of information on the social side of things, which is primarily the things that we hear about a lot, but we never actually talk about. And it will, obviously it's very speculative, so it would be complicated, but I would say take the history of what happened, the nastiness of what happened in these startups and add it to your, 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 your more your analytical and academic side of things. And I would be interested in seeing a product like that. I don't know if that would work. I don't know if I'm even given a great idea, but that's something I would be interested in seeing. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Building something. All right. James, uh, this is Jordan, very briefly. Um, uh, this is input on the feet on the pitch itself, not on the company. I'm not quite sure I understand what you do exactly to give you useful input. But if the goal is to get through to a guy in an elevator or an investor around you to get to, to pique their interest, it didn't quite work. And this is what the purpose of this is to help you fine tune your pitch. So the pitch was okay. It didn't get you to where you want to get to. Please practice and do what you need to do. You're going to get 10 opinions from three, three investors. So some of our input is valid. Some of it is up to you. Use it or lose it. All right. Was there specific feedback on what uh, one, one thing for me, I really like this idea, but I just don't see a way to kind of put a moat around this business and kind of protect it from someone else kind of coming in and doing something similar. Um, so that's kind of why I'm hesitant. Like the idea, and I think you have a chance of being really successful, um, but I just don't see how you can kind of, you know, make it so that you have a um, competitive, uh, sustainable advantage that you can kind of leverage over anyone trying to kind of do something similar. Because it seems like it's more of a methodology rather than like something specific to your company. So, all right. Thank you so much. Let's move on. Uh, thank you, Mati, for your uh, input as well. <laughs> We've got some debate on our <laughs> chat in here. So some people say that the chat, chat GBT can take over this. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> yes. Um, let's move on. Thank you so much, Connor. And um, uh, the next person would be Tarek. Uh, uh, Tarek, are you there? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, I two minutes. <laughs> two minutes and you can start now. Okay, thank you. Um, memory, if you can. Uh, sure. Um, we want to know you're not a chat GBT. We want to know your real person. <laughs> I've got it on. All right, go ahead. If it's not working, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say um, imagine basically a personal service that's um, environmentally friendly and pays you to deliver parcels in, um, in route to a destination. Uh, welcome to Share the Load. Share the Load is the world's first uh, peer to peer parcel delivery system uh, that pays users to deliver parcels in real time, uh, 24 7, locally and internationally, creating a harmonious, um, trusting, friendly uh, atmosphere. Um, I guess to give an example, as I'm, I'm from Australia, let's say someone wants to deliver a parcel near about uh, Parramatta to Sydney City, and I say live near Parramatta going to Sydney. There's no reason I can't pick up the parcel and deliver it as I'm going there anyway. 
Um, I guess the question that arises, what about illicit, um, illicit items? Um, I guess every user is screened onboarded with our partner um, who uses uh, artificial intelligence to onboard them. Um, we scan their biometrics, um, address identification, bank details, and telephone number. Uh, from there, when users want to send parcels, they are further prompted with pop-up screens to take exterior pictures of the parcel. Uh, upon the uh, arrival of a traveller who accepts um, and wants to pick up the parcel, they are then prompted with pop-up screens if the parcel looks tampered, modified, altered, and if the pictures match what the user has inputted. Uh, this, this gives them, I guess, assurance to the traveller he's indemnified. Um, and should any breach occur, we have obviously the data of the users and pictures that will be shared with um, authorities. Um, with any delivery, like with any, I guess, delivery that we have, our users are paid off a global formula, which is paid to the um, Hong Kong dollar, uh, 75.25. Um, so 75% to the user, 25% to share the load, to reward them for their time and, and in helping one another. Um, we are about maybe about 30 35% cheaper than like the likes of like DHL, FedEx, um, I guess the, the, the I guess those type of companies. Um, ultimately, we share the load. We are looking to become a people trusting service. Um, our startup is has I mean share the load has been in progress development for about maybe six and a half years. Um, we have intellectual property globally, um, which can be found in our uh, WIPO. Um, our company structure is extremely unique. Um, we are involved in building an ecosystem that can help global users from developing and developing countries um, help one another and respectively uh, solve the law. Eric, uh, you are out of time. Uh, please wrap it up. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah. So I was going to basically just mention one last fact. The, the world economy relies on a fast and efficient global supply chain, um, which is, I guess, valued over 15 trillion. And for that reason, I hope uh, Share the Load can be uh, able to solve it. All right, thank you. Okay. Have you had any, hi, Tarek. Have you had any conversations with DHL, UPS, any sort of like large uh, scale shipper? Because I'm concerned what would happen if one of these companies decided to do something similar to this, or maybe Uber decides to do something like this and you have a large competitor that's much, much, much bigger than you and you're kind of trying to kind of play in his vertical, so to speak. So how do you sure. plan to kind of tackle that? Sure. I mean, we've got a like, partnership already with like companies like SumSub and um, we have other partnership. We we're looking to go into partnership also with our MasterCard. But I guess in the P2P like parcel delivery space, obviously we are pegged to um, a global formula, which obviously I've derived. And we've got like intellectual property, which obviously, like I mentioned, could be um, found on WIPO, like the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, we, we are like, I'm really hoping to be like a first mover. I think competition is like, it is inevitable. Um, like competition will arise, but like we've seen with Uber, Deliveroo, um, and all the, and the likes of like the, the, I guess the delivery in, in the food space. Um, uh, but I guess, but ultimately you want to become like a first mover, a people trusting service. Like, I guess what differentiates share the load from like, say, like likes of like DHL coming up and creating something similar is that we are truly like a, a, a people trusting service. We are looking to become environmentally friendly um, and yeah, and create like a harmonious, trusting, friendly atmosphere across the globe. So that's what I guess that's what's really going to differentiate us. Uh, Derek, please uh, have concise answers because uh, it's, it takes a little bit too much time, but uh, with, all your res with all respect to you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Did I really? Did I really hear you've been working on this for six and a half years? Did I really hear that? Yeah, that's correct. I have. Yes. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that there are gig delivery services in every corner of the world, um, and you, you know, you've been working on it six and a half years. I'm not hearing a lot of traction from, you know, you would have said something if you had any traction. Um, or I mean, I'm 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 absolutely baffled that you think you're a first mover, and that you've been spending six and a half years, and you're not already proven in some market somewhere. In terms of, I mean, this is some marginally different than some all all the other gig delivery kind of plays is is what it sounds like. Why am I mis what am I misunderstanding here? 
And why is um, it so sure. hard to watch? <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll address uh, two questions. So, like we've just um, we've got on the application stores now with the proof of concept, which is now going to from proof of concept to a global stage uh, by next week. It has taken me six and a half years, um, and the reason being, uh, I, but I don't like necessarily like to discuss this. Four years ago, I was involved in a plane accident. Um, I've, I've, I'm paralyzed now. I'm yeah. So I mean, I was in hospital for about seven months. Um, like share the load became very, very stagnant. Like I I've completely cut off a lot of people. Um, and then for about three years post accident, like the whole startup had basically completely stored. Um, and for that reason, this is why it's been six and a half years. Um, four years prior, let's go back four years, the comp before the accident, I would have launched the um the MVP or the proof of concept back then. But because of obviously a lot of things have happened. I wasn't able to do that. So yeah. Is is that a good time to call time, Daniel? It's good, uh, right? We, it is good. We use that all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, but thank you so much for your story. We really uh, appreciate that. If any of the investors would be interested to connect with you, we'll definitely do that. Uh, and uh, um, investors will inform me right after, like or now or later. But thank you so much for your story. And Australia, amazing. Thank you for uh, sharing this. Everyone, uh, we're moving on. And uh, um, before we continue, uh, please use your real names because it's hard for us to identify who's uh, pitching. And uh, so first name, last name, because we can connect you with investors. And if you don't have a last name, we won't be able to do so. Um, and the next person is pitching is uh, Jay Fraser, New Domingo. Okay. Are you here? Yeah, I saw him. I saw him a few seconds ago. I know he's here. There he is. He's speaking, but we cannot hear him. Famous words. Uh -huh. blue. You're on mute, Jay. You're on. Now mute. I'm fine. Now I'm good. All right. Hi, I'm, I'm Jay Fraser. I'm president and co-founder of New Dominion Enterprises. We are commercializing a novel inorganic solvent for lithium ion batteries that was invented by my co-founder while he was a scientist at Idaho National Laboratory. We own an exclusive license from Idaho National Laboratory for the issued patent. We also have our own intellectual property that's been issued. We're currently manufacturing this material in our pilot manufacturer in North Carolina. We also have eight commercial companies that are currently evaluating this material in their uh, battery systems. Uh, and in January of this year, a couple of months ago, we completed a SBIR, SBI, sorry, an SBIR <laughs> program with AFWorks. Uh, and on February 8th, we were awarded two additional contracts from AFWorks totaling $2.2 million. So we've actually sold approximately $160,000 of our material to companies that are evaluating our material. And with the AFWorks contracts, we've now totaled $3 million in non-dilutive funding. Uh, my team has now grown to five people across four time zones. And we are raising, we are attempting to now leverage our government contracting with a $3 million raise that will help us not only to expand our business development, but also give us traction beyond the, beyond the contract money that we have. I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Well done, right? Thank, Thank you so much. Tell me, tell me a bit more about what does your product do? Our material, because it's inorganic, it resists heat. Therefore, the electrolyte in the lithium ion battery will not degrade and therefore will allow you to hold a charge in your cell phone, for example, for a lot longer period of time. Because it's inorganic, it will not burn. So even as a component to the electrolyte blend, the electrolyte, might, a cell in a battery pack might catch fire, but it would not propagate, meaning that if there are a dozen cells within a battery, if there are a dozen cells within your battery, uh, you could not, it would not propagate and actually blow up like the battery in New York City that was kept on, uh, I guess it was on the roof of an apartment building in the Bronx this past year, past week actually, uh, battery caught fire and burned the entire building down. Uh, we okay. are- All right. Uh, yes. I got it. I got it. The, the, the fear, oh. uncertainty that doesn't work with investors. So. Citing a problem that happened among millions isn't going to really get very far. But I love what you're working on. I love the SBIR. You're looking for money. Hey, tell me a bit more about 
what's that money going to do other than more a, a different factory, more production, more we're customers? Gonna what you we're going to expand our business development. We are focusing our business development on companies that either own already or are planning to build a gigafactory. We are involved with a battery manufacturer that's bringing us into a program with the Formula E race cars. We are just recently supplied material to one of the largest cell manufacturers in the world that they'll be testing our material. And we will also be adding to staff. We are looking to add eventually a chief operating officer, or I will step aside as CEO and add a younger uh, battery executive to um, basically become the public face of our company. We are a very experienced management team uh, and we are looking to grow. This year, we are projecting about a million and a half dollars in revenue. Uh, after tax, we should see about $300,000 on, on the bottom line. And um, Expanding business so, uh, development is where it's at. Yes, sir. So thank you, you have thank you. commercial. You have commercial contracts now. When you say a million and a half in revenue, I hear. I know you're sampling right now for you know for POC purposes. Are you actually? Do you actually have any design wins or any commercial revenue? It's taking a lot longer than I ever expected. The majority of the 1.5 million is contract revenue from the Air Force but we're trying to leverage those successes with commercial companies. Uh, frankly, we do expect at least one commercial business conversion this year. Jay, right. you, you we'll generate a couple hundred thousand. You, you, you gave the right answer, great. And, and Jay, I'd say again, for most of us who are, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at a lot of batteries over the years. Um, the, you know, it's a, so when you say you are a solvent, you are the liquid that makes an electrolyte a liquid, right? Is that what you're saying? That's absolutely. We, the, we the, okay. current electrolytes, current electrolytes in a lithium ion battery are liquid, non aqueous liquids, but they're carbon based, carbonate based. Ours yeah. is a phosphorus nitrogen compound that will not burn, therefore, as a replacement for yeah. a yeah. component. Okay. Okay. So what you didn't say, um, okay. So you're saying it won't burn. Um, almost certainly there's a give up somewhere else. Right. And in terms of, you didn't give me any of the others, you didn't give us any of the other specs in terms of, do you make the battery cheaper? Do you make it last longer? You kind of said that maybe you do, you do, do you make it more energy dense? Do you make it more power dense? What does yes. it do to the performance of the battery? And why did you... the battery is extended extended cycle life, extended calendar life, and okay. the ability to use high energy electrodes leading to increased energy density. We're currently working with companies that are in the lithium metal area, anode area, as well as silicon anodes. And one of our programs is marrying lithium metal to a high energy cathode that okay. what, will lead to the what are the, the trade-offs? What are the negatives? There's a very small reduction in capacity because of the viscosity of our material. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in conductivity because of the viscosity of our material. However, we are working on formulations that will address that. And so that power that reduces your power density. Is that what you're saying? But not it your energy. Reduces it reduces the conductivity, which would reduce the actual no amount of power that's being output. Yes, slight difference. Okay. Marginal... Percent one? Sorry? One percent, five percent, one percent, five percent, two percent? It's about a five percent, it's about a five percent loss. It's, it's not dramatic increase, the dramatic increase in safety as well as longevity, we believe, uh, compensates for that. And most of the companies that we're dealing with now appreciate the fact that while there is a slight loss in, in, in conductivity, the benefits outweigh the negative. Yes. Yes. So there's no perfect solution. Bill was on it. You give some, you take some, you take some, you give some. Um, Bill, were you done, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. I'm so done. Yeah. As, as an investor, uh, tell me about valuations. Wow. Our pre-money valuation right now, we're trying to raise $3 million on a pre-money of $15 million. Okay. 
And um, and the patent situation is when was it filed? Wow. When was it granted? How old is it? The, the multiple questions. The uh, patents that we licensed from Idaho National Laboratory are both issued. We have a patent on the current material that we're manufacturing. That patent actually has about another year and a half of life. The second material has uh, the second material, which improves upon the first material, uh, requires a little bit of development and has uh, 15 years of life on top of that. And our three issued patents that the company owns uh, were issued and were filed in 2017. So we've got about 19 years left. Got it. So uh, I, I connected with you on LinkedIn. I'm interested to talk further. As far as the pitch goes, you certainly got my interest. It's most about the innovation and the way you presented yourself. So congratulations, Sarah. Well done. And if you hire anyone younger than you, they're going to be a 16-year-old, 18-year-old. What are you doing, man? Come on. Keep it in the house. We're very experienced. <laughs> Let's just say that. So qu and quit, uh, quit, quit. Quick question. Yeah, so you, you said that you, you you mentioned revenue is a little over a million dollars. And if you're, you're you're raising 3 million at a pre-money 15, that imputes a post-money valuation of $18 million. So that means you're giving away about 16.66%. And on that revenues, that means that you're valuing your company today 12X the revenues that you projected, which aren't actually materialized. Can you explain a little bit about the business model quickly, if you can? That business justifies model. the eighteen million dollars. First of all, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't finish the last part of the question. Yeah, so I want you to answer the question in relation. No, you're fine. Answer the question in relation to the eighteen million dollar valuation that you're suggesting today, so I can understand given the that, business model. Given that we have eight companies currently testing our material, and given the relative size of the companies that are evaluating our material. The traction that we've developed and the potential of converting these test sites to actual commercial revenue is pretty good. Uh, we are also currently involved with two companies, almost three, that actually own a gigafactory. So that by a successful test result for any of these companies that have a gigafactory, we end up having dramatically expanded revenue. Um, we're the only company on the block, actually, that has something like what we have as an inorganic liquid that actually works in a battery. And we actually have a transition between lithium ion batteries and solid state batteries, which solid, solid uh, electrolyte batteries are five to seven years away. We're today. Understood. That answer will suffice. So I'm going to lean on my, my buddy, Jordan. Jordan, if there's something like you find something great here, if I, I would ask if you can tap me into it. I would love to learn more after you investigate further. I will hang with trouble all day long. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's it for me. All right. And Jay, and Jay, and just, uh, you know, again, congratulations. If what you say is true, it certainly is interesting. And I certainly would be interested in, I'd certainly be interested in learning more. So. And we're very definitely hoping that it is true. We've got okay. a lot of testing to continue. But okay. the companies that we are evaluating with are very large. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Let me some requests. Uh, let me just ask one question real quick. Um, what's the price difference between your material versus the material that is currently in use? At scale, we expect to be price neutral. Awesome. Yeah. We, I'm we, are not at, we are not at scale today, clearly. Yeah. But as we as we grow and as we get to scale, we expect to be price neutral or very close to that, given that our material will also allow the battery manufacturer or the electrolyte manufacturer to remove one or more of the components that already are putting that are already going into the electrolyte blend, therefore reducing some of the expense that exists in the current blend. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely interested in hearing more. This is uh, a little bit uh, too dense for a, you know, three to five minute conversation. So Definitely looking forward to uh, our conversation in the future. All right. Uh, that is, that is a challenge. challenge. Quick, a quick tip for you uh, uh, yes. on, the, on this panel, with all due respect, Bill is very grounded. His platform has access to hundreds of enterprise class customers that may find you useful. So try to win him over as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm.
So yeah, if Bill would be interested, we will connect. Yeah, definitely. And everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, reach out to me, and I'll I'll, I'll provide any information that you need. All right, thank Dude, you. Dude, you reach out to us. Come on, you come after I, us. We're not coming after you. What is wrong with you? I don't have this contact. I don't have contact. I don't have contact information. This is not a dolphin tank. This is Shark Tank. <laughs> So definitely we'll connect with Jordan and Matty and if Bill and uh, Durand would be interested, I'll definitely connect uh, uh, with them as well. So dear investors, uh, just inform me if you want to connect with anyone, I'll do it. And uh, those who get a uh, uh, confirmation from investors will get uh, uh, an e email from me uh, connecting you so you can continue. And uh, before we move moving to the next one, remember we have investors also in the chat right now and uh, you can network here exchange contacts and maybe beyond the panel you also get some interest in there so help out each other and get interest from uh, all investors we have been abroad uh, thank you for the opportunity gentlemen thank you so much for pitching uh today. john lee uh from loopy is the next uh, john are you ready yep you have two minutes go for it fantastic well my name is john i'm the founder and ceo of loopy the three word pitch is Uber for laundry. So we connect laundromats and individuals looking to earn additional income from the comfort of home with folks who don't have the time or hate doing laundry. We launched in 2018 and we've generated over $3 million in early stage revenue, despite the fact that we don't own a single washer or dryer. And I believe 2023 is perfect timing for this kind of business model to be fully applied and scaled to this vertical in the uh, in the light of, uh, at this point, 45 million Americans regularly use ride sharing or food delivery apps, uh, grocery delivery, food delivery, alcohol delivery. I think laundry delivery is the next logical vertical um, to explore innovation in the context of this massive change in consumer behavior patterns. We've raised uh, just north of three and a half million dollars to date from some incredible uh, angel investors, angel groups, and early stage VCs, including Jason Calacanis and the Launch Syndicate. And our goal moving forwards is, can we create a brand that is as synonymous with laundry as DoorDash is with food delivery, as Uber and Lyft are with ride sharing? I think this is a golden opportunity. It's a massive, untapped, universal problem that really does not have a centralized brand for consumers and a decentralized um, platform for providers of this service. So we're excited to grow and uh, looking forward to answering any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Right on time. Thank you, John. Again, John, I mean, haven't there been a bunch of startups that have tried this? And I mean, is I, I want to say purple purple tie do they do laundry or just dry cleaning or i can't remember but i know there have been we've heard we've heard the story for literally decades um you know uh uh you know gig laundry service what am i i mean what why why is it only now that it seems like it might work but and what happened to all the other guys that were doing this yeah uh i think timing for me is the logical um, first answer to that, 10 years ago, consumers weren't used to getting into a car with a stranger or even ordering food delivery. And I think that has shifted. Second, do I have to get in a car with a stranger to have you do my laundry? That doesn't no, make sense. No, but, I, but I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that because consumers today or they know about uber they know about airbnb uh, yeah um, and they know about and they know about all these gig laundry services right I sure but but i think okay. that why okay keep going <laughs> um but i think that when you look at the space they're you know all of those competitors that you mentioned they're very capital intensive so even if they offer a you know pickup and delivery mobile app based wash and fold service their models involve, you know, purchasing a laundry delivery vehicle, some of them lease or even build a laundry fulfillment center. And so that's more of the Amazon warehouse approach. But we think the better approach to solving this problem is let's not own any assets. Let's be a platform that facilitates existing operators and people who are looking to earn additional income to leverage their in-home, you know, washer and dryer, their, their 
um, assets that are not revenue generating. Let's give them an opportunity to earn income um, with those idle machines. Okay. 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 And no, okay. Um, you know, I, that makes a little bit of sense. That makes sense. And that would have been great to include in your pitch to say, yeah, there've been all sorts of laundry, you know, gig laundry services in the past, but what, what's different about us is dot, dot, dot. And then now my question is, is, has no one else done this, but you know, God bless. I would imagine COVID would be a huge tailwind for you. And now, you know, so I guess in a deeper dive, people are going to say, boy, you know, during COVID, this made a ton of sense because I did not want to go, you know, to the laundromat and drop off my laundry. I would, you know, I didn't want to have to do that. Um, I'm assuming your target audience are people who, you know, who otherwise they would have to go to the laundromat or they would have to deliver it to a laundry service. Is that your target audience? Because I can't imagine your target audience is somebody who actually has laundry, you know, has washer dryer at home. Yeah, it's a great question. We definitely have a niche of customers who are ordering us due to accessibility. But what's surprising and exciting for me and my team is that our highest LTV customers, believe it or not, they actually live in single family homes and have access to a washer and dryer in unit. And what we found is they have the disposable income. Usually it's uh, a family, both partners work full time. They are using Loopy for convenience in the same way that people order Uber Eats, even though you technically have probably a kitchen and, um, you know, you could even go to the restaurant, pick it up yourself. And so I think, you know, when you talk about the market, this is the kind of market where we see a market that doesn't even exist, right? There's the existing laundromat and dry cleaning business, $10 billion industry in the US. But in the same way that Uber almost created an extension on top of the existing cab industry in 2008, 2009, I think if we execute well, we can actually bring on consumers who are excited about an opportunity to save themselves some time doing laundry and use Loopy, even though they're not going to their local laundromat today. Okay. Someone else? Yeah. So we we, we talked before. We had the opportunity to dive a bit deep on some concepts. What has changed since the last conversation you and I had? Yeah, well, we are excited because I'm actually in LA right now launching some of the ideas that I spoke about just four weeks ago, which is the concept of, can we create a truly decentralized, um, more of a DoorDash model where let's bring on as many um, laundromat operators as we can, and they can list their services, right? They can list their price points, they can list what detergents they use, and now consumers have a wider net of selection in the same way when you go onto DoorDash, you can see all these restaurants. Some of them might be serving the same dishes, but they have different pricing, different reviews. And so we'd like to try to create that uh, ecosystem and in using LA as a, a starting point for that innovation. Yeah, nice. So perhaps we can meet today at, at my wine cellar and, and, and have, <laughs> uh, have another conversation. But what I would say, what I would say is, you, you're going to have to really figure out this 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 clustering. So what I what I see for you, maybe your go to market isn't dealing with the laundromats because as I as I mentioned to you before, if you think about the neighborhoods that actually need the services or they utilize these laundromats, they're not necessarily digital digital people. They're they're still carrying currency. And then you have to think if someone's aunt or grandmother, so specifically in this Hispanic community here in LA. They will have to get their grandchild to download your app and understand how to utilize the, the, the platform. And then, then the other side is some of them li like to wash the clothes because it's just an experience for them. So what, what you po possibly can consider is the thing that you're not really big on that you mentioned earlier, which is some type of cleaning on wheels. I can imagine if you came on a street and you had a washer and a dryer at a very small level inside of a van, and you can say, okay, on this particular street, we're going to service seven homes. So then your market, your available market, is not like the traditional two-sided marketplaces where you're measuring by, by neighborhood, you're measuring by street. Like on each street, our goal is to get at least eight homes where we know that X amount of time is going to be distributed for, for us washing inside of this van. And then we could just pour forward to the, the, the house or the home two doors down and then wash theirs and then two doors down and wash theirs. And then you can have seven vans on seven streets where you service like 32 customers. You're going to have to find out how to cluster density in one area 
to get this thing jump started before you scale out. Because if you go to market for the laundromats, it's going to be an uphill battle because you're educating the customer on changing from fiat to coming on side of your app and understanding credit cards. And then you have to deal with those individuals opposed to saying, hey, we're going to make it super simple and easy for you. We know that a lot of you all will want to utilize, have someone else wash your clothes. Like even my wife, she hates the idea of doing that. It's just for us, we have sons, so we can force them to do it. But if, if, if you're going to educate the market, I think the best opportunity for you is to perhaps invest in one of these vans and try that out to educate the people that's already washing it and you can save them time opposed to the individuals that you think may be your first customer, but it's going to be another uphill battle of getting them to change over to the digital world. Just some some, some thoughts. Yeah, thank you. That could be a future optimization, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, Duran, I'm gonna I, call I, love, I love the idea. Duran, I'm going to call Child Protective Services when you start forcing your son to do your laundry. I promise you. <laughs> the wine cellar and his doing laundry that doesn't quite work out. So, guys, <laughs> we're looking to invest in, in John and his company. But, uh, John, a few questions to clarify. Tell us about number of markets. Tell us about your revenue traction. Tell us about these key metrics to help everybody understand where are you on your journey for, for the company. Yeah, so uh, we launched... In a very scrappy way, I funded the business on a credit card. Um, it took us six months to raise our first angel investment. Uh, we optimized the product and then scaled from Seattle to Portland, Denver, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Austin. And our trailing 12-month revenue now is right around $1.25 million. Um, and then we've done a lot of product iterations um, in the last 12 months that I think help us scale even faster. Like, for example, we've plugged in to the Uber and the DoorDash and, and the Lyft APIs for their existing delivery network. So I think that's an important piece um, because that will connect our you know consumer facing and our um, washer facing uh, mobile applications. Um, but I hope that adds a little bit of context. And for just the average Loopy customer orders every 12 days, they're ordering um, about two and a half bags of laundry, about $75 average transaction value. Um, and and lifetime across all customers on the platform, average spend has been north of $700 per customer. And how many markets you're in, sir? Uh, we're currently active in uh, seven, eight of you include LA, um, and then nine of you include nor uh, the different neighborhoods within LA that we're targeting. And, and how many loads or how many pairs of socks have you watched so far? Oh man, a lot. I think uh, it's probably uh, you can't see it now, but um, the the blue duffel bag above my shoulder before about ninety thousand bags. So a lot of laundry, a lot of learning opportunities for us. Anything you could imagine relating to laundry, we've probably seen. Um, but I think you know what's exciting is everything that we've done up until this point is making me as the founder and CEO more confident that this is a billion dollar opportunity worth solving. And our mission at Loopy is to improve lives through laundry. And so we really are motivated knowing that every single time a customer orders on our platform, we're able to add value to the communities and the lives of both the customer that places the order and the washer that uh, is able to earn some income processing it. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, John. Did you did you what what was the raise again? Uh, yeah, we're targeting a two million dollar raise on a convertible note. It's a fourteen million dollar cap, twenty percent discount, and five percent interest rate. Got it. Well, you know, yeah. I'm already interested in this, so I, I would love to possibly meet with you in person. Been that, that you're here in LA, so let's let's talk about that offline today. Yeah, fantastic. Happy to. I will connect you via email today. Uh, I'll try to make sure that we connect you. All right. Uh, no more questions. We're moving on. Uh, one comment, uh, John. Uh, repeat after me. SEC disclaimer applies. Just say that. SEC, SEC disclaimer. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer applies. applies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. And we're moving on. Uh, we have a lot of projects uh, to review. And the next one is Dmitro Kruhlov. Uh, Mitro, if you're ready, uh, yes. let's hi. Two minutes, please. Do you hear me? Yes. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Dimitri. I am co-founder of Misu Company, and we are solving one of the big, biggest questions of the people is how to live longer and some someone even live eternal. 
and people created modern technologies how to care uh, health and a lot of these modern technologies are only in future but now we have situation where is 75 percent of deaths is from heart diseases and misu is about how to reduce this 75 percent to less than 15 percent and it is why we created misu application misu application predicts critical conditions before they appear. Misu applications collect uh, all medical and health data from smart devices and analyze it by using machine learning and AI and notify patients before something critical may happen. We connected to Misu application our own Misu smartwatches, also connected Apple watches, and uh, now we are connecting Huawei. Uh, in our whole system was tested in Ukrainian clinics, uh, in Poland clinics, and we are already available on the market. Our next steps will be mental health and pharmaceutical uh, functionality. And for um, last six months of our launch, we have more than two thousands of downloads, more than one thousand users. We have uh, hundreds of sales and uh, thousands of pre-orders. And we opened company in Ukraine and in Europe, and uh, we had personal negotiations with president of Ukraine and president of France and uh, the most important our team fully uh, um, fully have all needed resources scientists doctors and engineers and in next years uh, we will definitely work around uh, the world and we connect in the Ukrainian government our uh, missile uh, applications we connect top five smart devices for health monitoring uh, and save more people's lives. I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you so much, Mitra. Uh, okay. Thank you, too. Okay, so Dimitri, uh, first of all, where are you? Where are you on the regulatory spectrum? Are you, I mean, in either the EU or in the US, are you heading down? the you know mdr or the fda pathway or are you going to bypass that and you know pretend that you're like just an apple watch what are you doing now um, now we are uh, finished uh, gdpr in oil uh, and also past uh, trial clinics in uh, poland uh, private um, hospitals uh, also uh, we um, don't create some health devices yes so uh, we are using or smart watches uh, what already existed in the market uh, and collecting this data and uh, give for people predictions so, uh, so the you're, using, you're using somebody else's device you're putting your yes. label on it, i guess you're putting your branding on it is that what i heard or not Ah, no, 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 uh, sure, the main, showed, the main. Okay, I thought you showed, you know, your smartwatch, but no, you're, you're ah, using. Yes. Yeah, okay. I have, uh, I, I have one uh, of our device. Right? It's, it's okay. like a smart uh, fitness device, but more extended, uh, more extended uh, indicators measured. Uh, but um, it's not the main thing because um, on the market there is a lot of devices already existing and uh, Apple Watch con uh, adds a lot of things uh, year by year like temperature, like blood pressure and Huawei also. So we decided to concentrate to connect all these uh, smart devices which is already on the market and uh, uh, develop more our value in the application uh, where we predict and build forecasts for people to notify before critical. Okay, but so are you gonna go through some sort of FDA process to be able to make claims? Or are you, I mean, that become then because it's not your device, you have another issue there, but what, what, are, you, what are your plans in terms of FDA? Uh, 
now mm -hmm. so uh, we already work in ukraine yes it's like much much easier in ukraine um and but in europe we plan to get certifications in clinics in uh, um, in uh, universities health universities and yeah. uh, then move forward for the market okay okay all right and so um then in terms you know you started out saying that you're going to enable people to live forever i don't know if that was did you really say that um, um but okay so you're you're um you know there are lots and lots and lots of devices out there that are doing well they're doing you know ecgs um yes, yes. And, you know some are approved some are not approved but you know what they're again it's hard it's hard to cross the line between sort of alerting and identifying patterns and actually making recommendations or diagnosis. What are you saying you're doing? Are you providing the doctor with an alert, the consumer with an alert, or are you saying, you know, you've got atrial fibrillation, X, Y, Z, right? Where, where, where are you in that? Um, now we um, connected, uh measuring uh, all main indicators like heartbeat temperature blood pressure blood oxygen also uh, we have own device with ecg measuring also we connected uh, ecg from apple watches and also analyze ecg with ai and, uh, and give some uh, give analysis about uh, uh, health value about uh, some criteria about uh, in what state is your health. And first of all, uh, when uh, Misu see some possible critical condition, we uh, contact doctor if it is possible for a person or uh, notify a direct person that there is some risks. Uh, you should uh, mention this and go to the doctor. So we don't say like, you should do this, this and this. Yes, we only notify people about risks. We also show uh, for patient uh, statistic about another patients. Yes, uh, like um, what is with another patients in these situations, what they are doing. Yes, and gives for people such recommendation. In Ukraine, we connected uh, insurance company. Uh, so all our users in Ukraine are have uh, insurance and uh, in some in any like critical situations they can uh, 24 7 call uh, assistance and get help all right okay i'll let i'll let other judges talk are there more questions all right so let's move on thank you so much for your presentation and uh, thank you too bye any project from ukraine is important for us we support uh, ukraine and uh it's uh it's great to see innovation happening from uh, that part of the world uh thank you thank so you. much and keep uh, networking uh in the chat that we have investors in there too all right let's move on and the next project would be nuro francois grant francois you ready again yes uh, hi how are you thank you all for uh this uh, meeting uh, I'm new from uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. I'm the founder and CEO of Neuro. Uh, we specialize in communication and computing by brain instantaneously and without any surgery of any kind. We are US FDA clearance since 2019 with multiple US IRB clearances as the only technology and the only treatment of its kind which works on patients up to stage six neurodegenerative state. We are also commercially cleared by Health Canada, and we operate now uh, over 100 different implementation sites in North America, in the Middle East, in Asia, and in Latin America. Uh, we have four released products uh, at this point in time, three more in clinical trials. We uh, started uh, out of uh, California, actually in, uh, in Palo Alto and uh, San Francisco with SOSV Venture Capital in the bio. Uh, we've attended eight other uh, accelerators in life sciences and uh, business technologies, uh, both in, in the US and in Canada. Uh, we are uh, fundamentally uh, B2B, B2G, in some cases B2B uh, to C. Uh, and 
We uh, really uh, specialize at this point in time uh, in uh, several pathophysiologies for children uh, all the way to adults and, and the elderly in uh, eight different points of care. Uh, we uh, also have a tremendous uh, IP portfolio. Uh, we have been sponsored by not only Fulbright since uh, uh, day one on our end, and uh, we have uh, multiple patents that have been granted. Some that are in final phases of uh, PCT. Uh, our key competition is uh, Neuralink and uh, Synchron. Uh, at this point in time, we have uh, more patients uh, than anybody else uh, in uh, this uh, particular industry uh, across multiple territories. And uh, um, fundamentally, we have a, a very experienced team. I'm uh, myself a serial entrepreneur. This is my fifth company of a 30 year career. My last company was Global. Uh, some of my clients uh, were, for instance, Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, Transcontinental, Quebec, or Sony, Disney, and many more. Uh, and uh, we are raising uh, our Series A at this point in time. We are looking for $50 million US at a valuation of $400 million. Uh, I'll be able to give you more details uh, on your questions or offline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Great to have you. Okay, questions? So, Francois, I got to say, I mean, I was trying to tease out what you do. I mean, I got from neuro that you're doing something with brains uh, <laughs> and that your only competitor is Neuralink. So then I'm assuming, OK, so you're a Neuralink. Really? Are you a Neuralink? I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not clear. I'm not clear at all what you do. Absolutely. So I will clarify this for you. Uh, let's say for sake of argument that you have a stroke, which happens every two seconds around the world, you might end up in a state of what is called akinetic mutism. In other words, you cannot move your body and you cannot use your natural speech capability. At that point in time, you are fully entrapped by your body. You have cognition and you fully understand what's happening with your caregivers and your loved ones. Unfortunately, you cannot communicate with them. I give you the ability instantaneously to communicate back with them without any surgery of any kind. So Neuralink, Synchron, Paradromics, BlackRock Neurotech are the key players uh, in the world today in terms of invasive neurotechnology. I provide a solution that is non-invasive and instantaneous and calibration-less. Uh, beyond that, I also have another patented technology uh, for North America. Wait, 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 wait. So are you, are, are you one of those EEG headsets? Is that what you're doing? We are, we are a multimodal uh, technology which instantaneously adapt to different signals inside of your prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is a technology which uh, differentiates us from classic neuroscientific approaches which usually use the motor cortex or the visual cortex. And as you might know, the prefrontal cortex is where you make executive decision centers in your brain. And we use those decisions to instantly communicate and compute. Yeah, Francois. So Francois, I, I, I think what the question is, because you're explaining the neurology and the technology and the science. Are you a, are you a brain microchip? No. What's, what's your actual tech? Are you, are you? I will, you know, I will tell you, we use different technology. One is right here in a pair of designer glasses. You would have no idea that I'm using this, but I actually listen passively to every neurological signals coming from the upper nasal area. And then we have also an ultralight headband, which looks at your prefrontal cortex. And then from there, we have four different products, uh, over two dozen different user interfaces, which allows you to communicate to your loved ones, your nurses, your clinical uh, you know, staff uh, for you to no longer be entrapped by your body. And this happens to a vast uh, set of pathophysiologies across different points of care. Okay. Okay. So your, uh, yeah. So, so if, if I'm understanding you correctly, there is a software interface that interfaces with the actual device that the hardware there's four layers of technology that are seamlessly combined together. You have a hardware layer, you have a software layer, you have a set of algorithms, and you have AI deep learning all working seamlessly together, Got instantaneously, it. looking precisely at what your brain can emit, and then we work from there. Got it. And again, we're the, okay, so the entire world. Doing. The reason, yeah, yeah so, okay, so what, what the, the reason I asked about the, the, the brain microchip, because what I want to understand with your technology specifically, how is it conclusive? So. It, is it going to be able to determine like my hypothalamus if I'm fatigued with a cynic signal by measuring my hypothalamus to know that I'm actually fatigued and I can I can measure that actual data? What's conclusive about your eyeglasses or the other piece that you put over your head 
right. that's so, going to be able to send this particular signal conclusively. Yeah. So as I stated, we use from the prefrontal we use the prefrontal cortex. Okay, no other areas of the brain, and we have those different layers of technology that can not only allow you to communicate instantaneously with your environment. They can also control, let's say, smart assistants, IoT integrations. But also we have information instantaneously of your cognitive performance, your level of brain activity, your level even of calmness versus stress. Uh, and we can monitor that over time. So if you're in a de de neurodegenerative state, let's say you have ALS and you end up from a stage one to a stage six over seven years, we can tell you exactly what's happening. Right now I have clients uh, without disclosing from some of the largest institutions, clinical and hospital uh, you know, institutions in the world, that have been using our technology since 2019 as per our regulatory clearances. And those patients had a prognosis of six to nine months. They are still with us years after implementation and still able to communicate with their loved ones and their clinical stuff. Okay, so Francois, maybe. maybe. Go, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, we've, we've been looking at this, you know, okay. So we've been looking at these guys for many, many years. Um, and what you're saying is extraordinary. I mean, we looked at, I mean, I've known NeuroSky for 20 years or so out of Stanford. And, and if what we're saying is true, it is unbelievably extraordinary that, I mean, right now, the ability to read intention from the brain and translate it into human speech is pretty limited. You're saying that right now, today, you can put one on my head and I can talk without moving my lips. Is that okay? I can instantaneously, within the single same session, put our devices on every single one of you live, and you will be able to compute and interact with our system without any calibration. Yes. Does that mean I can essentially you can you could enable Stephen Hawking to talk real time? Absolutely. Wow. wow. Okay. I mean, wow. You are you are you telling me you're not on the front page of you know, every I've been in the company, Business Insider, and a bunch of other ones, but uh, we've been stealth for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, you can look at LinkedIn. Yeah. I have a bunch of release all over the world right now. Okay, no, I mean, because you know, I have a dear, dear friend who's been struggling with this for almost 20 years. I know, uh, you know, who is using who's been trying pretty much every device he could get his hands on, um, or to say his wife can get her hands on. Um, and you're saying you can put this on his head and he can talk to us. I would love to help him. Yes. Okay. I got it. I got to, you got to, you know, you got to connect me, Daniel, or whatever. You got it. It will happen. Yeah. So, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't really, I, I didn't really hear the, the answer to the question, but perhaps we can talk a bit offline because if you figure this thing out, I'm a super science geek and, and a super neurology geek, I would be interested, but a, a little bit about the valuation. You, you're saying that you're raising 15 million at a, a what $400 million post valuation that imputes that you're giving away about 3.75%. Can you uh, just elaborate on that just a little for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I have patented technology and results that are superior to, for instance, Synchron, which raised in December a $75 million Series C at a I think it's $382 million valuation right now. And then Neuralink, which is uh, obviously Jim knows uh, New Zealand very well, uh, is nowhere close to be on human beings. There's a ton of problems. Their valuation is $2.1 billion, and they're nowhere close to having any type of features that can compare to what we do. And beyond that, I won't talk about my revenue without an NDA or CDA, but I can tell you more about what we're doing from that perspective as well, offline. Francois? Yes? Um, without talking about revenue, how many devices you have, how many enterprise class engagements do you have? Give me more uh -huh. of the commercial. Sure. Yeah, as I mentioned, we've done over 100 implementation sites in Canada, in the United States, in Asia, in the Middle East, uh, and I'm uh, launching Latin America uh, within the next few weeks. So you have 100 devices or 100 sites with multiple no, devices? No, 100 implementation sites. Implementations. What's an implementation site? It can be uh, usually a relationship with uh, clinicians, hospitals. So I'll give you a few. Montana in New York City was the first one. Shirley Ryan BT Lab in Chicago, which is the largest translational hospital of its kind, and many more. So I have uh, a long list of, uh, of key hospitals and KOLs that I can share with you again offline. 
Thank you. Are you a, a U.S. corporation or a Canadian? No, we are at this point in time the Canadian corporation CCPC. Uh, although that we have uh, investors from the United States as well. Okay, I'm seeing that you only raised 700k on crunch base. On crunch base, yeah, the number is a little bit off. We have uh, also uh, federal grants, provincial grants, two MIT competitions. Uh, we were CIX top 20 most innovative tech firms in Canada this year, uh, or actually last year, uh, World Festival top 50 startups in the world and more. So we've gotten a bunch of different prices as well and non dilutive uh, funding that we received. So that crunch base number has you know, some of the public information that we released, but not everything. Got it. Last two questions is, have you, have you engaged any of the top tier VCs on this yet? And has there been any due diligence done on your company, yeah. your technology, and your financials? Yeah, I have two groups with, uh, you know, representing us right now, uh, one in North America, the other one in Europe. Uh, and yes, I have talked to many, many VCs uh, in my career at Neuro and, uh, and prior to that. Now, within the context of this company, what's the venture capital interest in working with you? So we have uh, been in due diligence and I have one term sheet already received. At the valuation, uh, a slightly lower valuation, but it was before some of the IP development that not only was Fulbright just uh, announced to me recently. All right, well, you for sure got this 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 chat on fire, but he wants you to make it happen. Um, I'm just going to say something and hopefully I don't regret it. I hope okay. this is half as true as what you say it is and that's what i usually that's what i usually hear but uh thank you yeah I'll, i can give you more details but obviously we have a few minutes only to cover what uh, what i'm saying but uh, i certainly can give you more details and show you live what it looks like at uh, another time and i assume two so quick things sorry just just quite i assume sosv is an investor is that true yes absolutely they were our first investor out of any uh, bio in San Francisco. I'm sorry, Duran. We were the yeah. first Canadian company yeah. to ever go to any bio as well. Yeah, one, one, you can, you probably should reach out to Crunchbase to update your site because that's that's all like most investor, investor community has to validate what your, what's your current capital raise. It's a really simple email for them to update that. And two, can you talk about your exit strategy? Because today, I don't know if there's feedback from, 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 your, from your audio. It, it, it's right. coming okay. from you. Uh, uh, yeah, your microphone is. Am I on? Right. <laughs> okay. So, so the, can you talk about the exit, the exit strategy? Because if you're suggesting today that your business is for 400 million, the, the idea is that you can sell the business today for 400 million. But if, if I'm buying 3.75%, I only break even on that. So what's your what's your exit strategy regarding right. valuation? So again, I uh, I can't divulge all of the work that we've done on our end, but I also have another patented technology, which is in direct conflict, so to speak. And I'm the earliest mover in that domain with a very large company that I'm sure most of you know in California. Um, so that's also another part of it. So it's either an acquisition, it's going to be an MA play anyway, as far as I know, because in Neurotech, there's more and more players that are coming in. We are very, very early on, you know, in that industry. Uh, so there are much larger companies that eventually will buy us out, you know, or we are going to collaborate and ourselves will buy other companies and, and become, you know, one of the key leaders anyway in the, in the marketplace. Um, the other aspect of it is I've already been approached for IPOs. Uh, and I haven't made a final decision with my board yet. Interesting. Okay. I, I want to learn more. I will connect you. Okay. Yeah. Neuro.world, or you can uh, contact me in terms when I'm in uh, Canada, Francois Neuro.ca. But if you want to learn more, Neuro.world, you can see also videos of our work and a bunch of. We will connect you via email. Uh, and uh, uh, so, Matthew, do you have any questions? Uh, no real question. Okay. Just. Uh, I, I think you're probably going to have a little bit difficulty raising at the 400 million, uh, simply because it's really, really high, and right now capital is going to get really, really tight. So yeah, um, you might consider going back to that original um, uh, offer sheet, whatever that um, you know raise or valuation was. But yeah, I am definitely interested if you can actually kind of make it prove all the claims that you've kind of said, you know, I'd love to set up a demonstration or something like that where I can, you know, just see it online. It doesn't have to be in person or whatever. So. Sure. So neuro.world, you can see videos. If not, I can arrange, you know, a zoom at your convenience. 
Uh, and fundamentally, I'm also available uh, live uh, anywhere in the world. So you let me know. Fantastic. All right, let's move on. Thank you so much. We have five more projects. Uh, uh, Francois, uh, from our end, uh, just congratulations. You had uh, a lot of interest here in the chat and from the investors. We will connect you. And uh, uh, you are pre approved to our next program, Pitch to Global Investors, so you don't have to go through all the steps. Uh, but to, to the final step and uh, the uh, app, please register in the app, create your profile. There will be more investors might be interested in you. Uh, and you. I'll send you the link right away. And the next person is um, Mike Sadofiev, uh, Data Terra. Mike, you there? Yeah, I'm here. You Can got you hear me there. well? Good. Yes. Yes, great. Thank you for this opportunity. So I'm Mike from DataTerra.io. I'm a founder and CEO. So we basically provide the IT solution which can transform any, literally any kind of data to the structured spreadsheets. So I have 20 years of experience in data and analytics, building large data warehouses and including leading of artificial intelligence practice at Accenture. And this project is like our, my and our mission to disrupt the data engineering industry at all. So literally, uh, we can transform spreadsheets, Excel files, uh, PDFs, uh, CSV files, databases to the structured spreadsheets without code in five to 10 minutes. This is like chat GPT, but for data integration. Uh, we, have, we are conducting several pilot projects in forensic, HR, uh, sales operations, uh, and uh, several other topics just to build more like vertical solutions to show how this thing works. We plan to uh, do public, uh, to go pu public in uh, April or maybe May 2023. Uh, and now we are raising pre-seed round. We are currently bootstrapping. Uh, we are currently raising pre-seed round of 500K to scale. Infrastructure costs a lot and data scientists cost a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and uh, what's the question? Mike, Mike, when you say go public, what do you mean by that? Oh, it's like chat GPT. So you can register there, you can chat something there, and you can uh, can get the uh, like you response. You put it in the market. Okay, got it. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, got, got it. So uh, with respect to what is so significantly different other than there's hundreds of companies that do something like you do. What is it about you that's unique? Oh, no. uh, so uh, let's say there are uh, two types of companies. The first type of company is like, uh, for example, Zapier, which connects uh, hundreds of data sources and can collect these uh, data from different data sources to the single, uh, single like, I don't know, spreadsheet or like single data format. Uh, that's the first, uh, that's the first area. But these data sources are well known, like Salesforce, HubSpot, etc. Second area is test custom data sources, like basically uh, custom solutions, like CSV files or uh, I don't know, uh, just just very niche solutions or hard coded things. And uh, here, or for example, some solutions like flat file or one schema can help a lot, but they work only with with CSV. What I do, and this is our, uh, I'm not talking about the large hyperscalers like IBM, AWS, and Microsoft, et cetera. They deal with large enterprises that not go to a small and mid-sized market. They uh, acquire lots of data engineers. I'm not a- That's a very long answer. Give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it would help. Sure. You could could you offer a sort of a case study example of sort of the best, highest, best use of what you uh, do compared to, you know, the alternative? Oh, so uh, just an example, one of the pilot projects. I, uh, I'm i uploading the uh, 500 construction PDFs from 50 uh, suppliers for the forensic purposes. And this solution combines all these 50. 500 PDFs to one uh, spreadsheet, and analysts can uh, analyze this data uh, like in uh, half an hour. Before and you're it saying, took and like you're three saying, months. You're saying it extracts all the data from each of the PDFs. 
Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And not only extracts, but like place the exact data point to the exact cell of the target spreadsheet. Even if the data quality is wrong. Even if the invoices are different. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what the, what is the input. Okay. No, Mike, Mike, I, I, I get what technically is getting done. What I don't get is what makes you special. Because there's going to be Joe Blow and Danny and Andy who will do it 10 times better than you in six months in a year. What is it about you that makes you investable? I get what you do. I got it. T take me to where why an investor want to speak to you because someone else is going to come up with a better mousetrap in six months. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I I think that uh, that we with this without a forecast we can we can acquire like uh, maybe ten ten thousand uh, k small and medium sized uh, companies and startups with this solution and we can i think reach error at uh, 250 million uh so i guess it's pretty large solution in terms of that current data integration software focuses on large enterprises we are focusing on the companies who cannot afford this and this pretty much uh, pretty much thousands of companies tens of thousands okay so and this okay Go ahead. Are, are you guys utilizing the open API, API, the chat GPT API for your technology? Uh, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite the same, but we offer the, like, we, we are open, uh, we, we can, uh, we can make it, uh, like, Yes, we, in some cases we do, but uh, with the market solution, we will be uh, uh, we will not use this. It's, it will be. What, what I'm asking is, what I'm asking you, what I'm asking is very, is very simple. Did you guys utilize Chat GPT's API to build your technology? Just for just for A/B testing now. Okay. For, okay. Uh, for some data. The reason why. Yeah. Yeah, the reason that's important because then the question becomes why not? What what if Chat GPT wants to actually build this thing out? We've seen a lot of times there's nothing wrong if you're going to utilize a framework, SDK or an API on to build out the initialization of some of your software. And in fact, your software is always going to utilize some forms of SDKs and APIs. But we've seen this happen before. And one of the, the stories come to mind is what happened with, with Meerkat when they built out this really big framework and raised a lot of capital, but then Twitter Said, hey, you know what? We're shutting down our API for you guys, and you guys have until tomorrow oh, okay. to figure this thing yeah, out. And it literally, it literally crushed their business. It literally crushed their business. So, uh, if if your technology is that great, it sounds cool. If, if it's not proprietary, where you're building some framework that's going to be adjacent to the Chat GPT, but on the other hand, you're actually utilizing Chat GPT's API. I, I don't understand how you validate the technology being that unique. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. So yes, uh, we are substituting open AI things. So I work with uh, data scientists uh, from my <laughs> past, let's say, and yes, we will uh, we will not uh, we will not be connected with uh, with open AI. And even we will uh, we can be installed inside of the uh, enterprise network. Like I mean, without the connection to the internet, completely offline. Is that the, oh. the answer to the question? So I will tell you the um, I have tried, and, and now I'm blanking on the names. But I've tried, you know, I've I've tried the stupid um, expense, you know, receipt apps. You know, you scan your you scan your receipt, and it's supposed to capture expense. And you know, I haven't found one that really works very well, just because receipts are a mess. And right. Are you telling me that you're going to, that I could use you and I'll have yes. zero exactly. problem, right? You <laughs> can upload uh, one uh, in any number of uh, presentations from the startups to this thing, and it will provide you with a table like Notion, like on Google Sheets, with the name and the ARR 
the number, uh, the name of founders, and other uh, information from these presentations. Uh, just yeah. just like yeah, minutes. okay. I'll try you. I'll try you out. So you're. I can. I can. I can try you out now. Right? Is it yes. Okay. No. I can't. I can't. I can't try you out now. Uh, just in person. So far. Just in person. <laughs> Okay. I mean, after, right. after the call, just piloting. When, Infrastructure when costs you, a lot. <laughs> when you, when do you so launch? Far. Wait, when do you launch and what's your pricing going to be? When do you, what? Uh, there will be a freemium, uh, just like uh, with ChatGPT, about uh, 20 pages per month for, like, if we are talking about the pages. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, with like pay as you go pricing for the like extended purposes, it's unlimited, hopefully. But it's very specifically, you're saying it's very specifically page based. It's not, it's not, you're uh, not integrating databases. That's it's your um, pages and capturing data. Is that what no, you're saying? Mm, no, not exactly. Actually, okay. uh, are we just counting our pricing? on page based uh approach and just for like understanding of what it uh what the capabilities because the page is like people understand what is the page of the text but it doesn't matter so we can we can uh, uh we can import database you can okay Custom Sounds... database i mean all right because yeah i mean most data is not in page format right <laughs> so. yeah sure it can be csv or api custom api or i don't not the binary data so far but so maybe okay at some point in time all right okay we'll try to figure this out all right thank you right thank you so much uh if any of the investors would be Thanks. interested we will inter we will connect you thank you so much for your presentation and uh we are approaching the final presentation and uh, let's, uh, according to Bill's uh, uh, note, just write in the chat, let's pick a female founder in here. Jacqueline Amani, uh, please go for it. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, my name is Jacqueline Amani. I am the CEO and founder of Drive Now. Um, the problem we're trying to solve is auto repair. Um, over the past several decades, auto repairs have not changed much to their day-to-day -day operations. Um, surprisingly, most independent shops still handwrite their repair orders. Um, there's not a real affordable way to uh, implement technology to their day-to-day -day operations, which makes auto repair a dreadful time-consuming task for the customer. Um, so Drive Now is a automotive service aggregator. It's a two-sided marketplace uh, connecting customers and repair shops. From our platform, customers can get a, a estimate for their vehicle repair. Uh, schedule their maintenance or schedule their unplanned breakdown. Um, we have on-demand booking and we offer free pickup and delivery. Uh, so Drive Now launched in the Bay Area in 2021. This is my second uh, automotive startup. My first one uh, got funding from Tiger Global and I worked my way out of a position. So I took some time off. Um, so during the first 30 days that I launched Drive Now, I was able to sign up 50 plus repair shops. So the benefit of uh, for the shop is that uh, we increase the car count. We also supply the shop with free with free software, so um, that they are able to get up to date and and book things uh, with the software. Um, we're right now we're trying to build software that uh, has con that uses constraints, so that when a customer books an appointment, it will uh, look for a shop within the first fifteen mile radius. Um, our software is also a way for us to communicate, for the shop to communicate with a service advisor. Uh, we recently added a paid subscription for our partner shops for technical support and diagnostic training. Um, so right uh, in 2022, our revenue was 354,000, which with an average repair order of 1154 uh, and 54% gross uh, profit margins. So um, yeah. It looks like my time's kind of up. So um, I hope you got you as excited about Drive Now that I am, and I appreciate your time. All right, thank you so much. Did you mention how much you were raising, Jacqueline? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we're looking for two million. <laughs> raising two million? Yeah. And, and what's the valuation on that? Um, I, so the valuation on that, good question. 
I do not have an answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't, 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 don't work yourself over that. But I have okay. another question. I just wanted to uh, uh, sure. learn about the economics. So have you reached out to like a AAA, Midas, like any other big guys that own all these auto shops? Yes. Yeah, so right now we're um, currently partnering with RepairPal, uh, your mechanic. Um, we have a, a we have corporate like enterprise uh, perks with like LinkedIn. So if a LinkedIn employee comes in, they get a 10% discount. That way we're generating some revenue uh, versus just doing marketing with one one customers. So really trying to get some enterprise accounts is the best way to get it started. Um, so we just recently launched. On North Carolina, we have zero clients. So we're now trying to, to get the clients and the shops. So we just launched in North Carolina last month. Are those the only two markets you're in so, so right now yeah yeah so really quick if i just want to understand the customer journey sure. I, I if something happened to if something happened to the uh, my, my wife and i vehicle we have to go directly to porsche they have to do a diagnostic in some cases we can go to another guy if we want to get our brakes fixed or something but if there's something electrical or something very specific to the vehicle we have to go directly to porsche how does it work for like specialized vehicles that may have to deal directly with the manufacturer outside of the auto shops that you're working with? How do you deal with that that type of customer? Not suggesting that we can't get some of the things on our car fixed elsewhere, but how right. do you reach those type of customers? So are you saying you have to go directly to Porsche because you're under warranty or because no, that's no, really no, the only no, time you have to go there? No, no. What, I, what I'm saying is, okay. That's why I gave the example saying if, if we wanted our brake fix, we can get that fixed from somewhere else. If it's mm -hmm. something that's electrical and specific to oh. the Porsche software, yes. and like how how do you deal with the customer if I wanted to and I had to go to Porsche? Do you partner with the, those individuals as well? Where mm -hmm. I may need to I may need to utilize your software and mm -hmm. I see like, hey, I need a checkup. I need to go to this particular individual. I, I'm I'm attempting to understand the customer journey in that particular yeah. use case. So really depending on the kind of car. So if you're dealing with Porsche, we have Porsche specialty shops. Uh, we also have like Mercedes specialty shops. So we pair the car to the shop, the actual shop. So don't we, know. Go ahead. Uh, Donald, can we mute Philip? Philip, okay, yeah. Yeah, some, somebody's unmuted. Yeah, okay. so please. Can you, Jacqueline? Yes. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Okay. Yeah, so basically like I was saying, um, so depending on the specific repair that's needed and the, the uh, line of vehicle that we're working on, we will pair that to our one of our partner shops that works on those type of cars. If it was a Jaguar versus a Porsche or a European car or domestic car. So uh, we have a specific uh, network of shops that specify in each line of cars. Now, if, the, if we take it to one of our Porsche shops and they get stuck, that's where we offer this remote uh, technical support where they can actually log into the, the repair shop's diagnostic tool and help get that thing taken care of. Got it. So that's the thing I was attempting to understand because it sounds when you said two-sided marketplace, well, one, it sounds as if you're just connecting two parties. And yeah. I wanted to know if there's some underlying technology that you guys have as well in right. addition to connecting those actual parties. Okay, thank you. Right. And the and the the shop and the customer never talk to each other. Uh, Drive now is the only that we're like the middleman. So the 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 way that we're able to uh, get the shop to sign up is we we take care of the client from a hundred percent standpoint. They will never talk to the client. The client will never talk to them. We are the customer for the shop. The customer is our customer. So we manage the entire process. We're advocating for the customer customer to make sure that they're only getting the things they need done versus you know going to the shop. And if they were to go to the shop directly, they would be paid 10% more than dealing with us, which makes it more beneficial for them to use us. Got it. So you're creating a marketplace, you're creating a customer support model, mm -hmm. you're creating an engagement model, yeah. all of that, that sounds great. Thank you for that. Uh, back to, to, um, to my good friend's question, is there a tech behind all of this? Or don't, don't take this the wrong way, but is it just basic? data management, data processing, that's first question. The second is you've been in business for a year and seven months today. Give me some KPIs and your traction, customers, churn, transaction volume, transaction size. Give me the investor stuff. 
Okay, a lot of questions. So <laughs> um, this is, like I said, this is my second startup. The first one was in 2019. And within two years, they were, were able to get funding from Tiger Global. They think they just got a uh, $14.5 million funding round from Tiger. Are you, pitching the old, are you pitching the old company or the new company? Old company. So then, so now the new <laughs> company. The new company. New company. <laughs> so new company, oh yes, we just started. At, uh, last, was it uh, 2000? So it's been uh, two years now. Um, and I took about six months off because I got married. Uh, but yes, we've had over 350 customers with an, about $1,154 um, average ticket, which our, uh, the profit margins are 54%. Um, we were strictly doing Euro in the beginning. Now we're, we're doing everything. We also do body work, uh, tires. I mean, anything from the, anything the car needs from bumper to bumper, we can handle insurance take, claims. Take me, take me back to the KPIs, the metrics, the numbers. So uh, we had, yes, $354,000 in revenue last year. Uh, oh, average, okay. Average repair order was 1154. Gross profit is about 54%. Uh, so you acquire a customer, the likelihood of a customer using you again isn't, it's not going to be every month or every week. So no, so I'm mean, on average, you go to see your mechanic one to two, one to two times a year, you know, if you're lucky. Okay, so <laughs> if you have a Euro car, probably two to three times a year. <laughs> what's the customer acquisition versus the lifetime value of, give me the, the financials of the company. So the what was the question? Sorry. Acquiring customer costs a little bit of money by the time yeah. you put it through, blah, blah, blah. And then how do you continue the flow of the deals? So the customer acquisition is about, the uh, cost is about 200 and right now $280 per customer. Um, and I think once the customer starts using our, our service, they, I mean, we, we have repeat customers. Uh, we don't, unless they move out of the area, they sell their car, but Right now, especially since COVID, people are keeping their cars uh, a lot longer than before. Nobody wants yes. to get rid of their used car. It's cheaper to keep her. <laughs> so, so that's on the consumer side. What about on the business side? What's the acquisition cost on the business side? So on the business side for the repair shops, you're saying? Yeah, the, the acquisition, there's really no cost to that. If we're basically, I mean, just sales side. Um, I'd say to get the shops about $150 is the, of what it's going to cost. Uh, we're supplying them with free shop software, which we actually have a, um, we're not charging them for like the first six months to a year. After that, we're hoping that they will continue using the software at a paid subscription. Got it. I'm going to stop now. Much more questions. Your pitch is good, but given your history, it could have been much better. So <laughs> let's talk. Let's fine tune okay. because because what you're doing makes sense, but let's fine tune it. So next time okay. I talk to some of us, boom, we hit it home. And okay. congratulations on getting married. All right, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, uh, I, we probably need to wrap it up uh, to let every judge to finalize it. Uh, sure. before, before we do that, dear investors, do you have any questions to this startup or we can wrap it up? I just have one quick comment. Um, I've seen three or four of these specific companies. Um, in the past about six weeks or so. Um, and I have to say that yours is probably the most well-rounded. Um, you're you. the only one that has this software um, application. Um, and that was something that I was kind of pushing two or three of them on uh, to mm -hmm. try and develop as kind of like a moat. Um, yeah. And um, have you had a, have you figured out a good way to actually um, pick up the customer's cars? Because right now, Pretty much everybody that I've talked to is just using Uber or Lyft and just, you know, paying the full price. And it, it's becoming a drain on their finances, to be honest. And yeah, no, so before you, you finish, have... uh, okay. Bill Reichert got to jump off uh, uh, and uh, let, let's, be, let's let Bill Reichert to actually close and uh, we will let uh, you answer if that's okay. Yeah, real, real quickly, and thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, real quickly, and it applies to Jacqueline as well. Um, you know, one of the things that is fairly consistent in the pitches that we heard today is that a lot of the companies were doing things that other companies have tried to do or are doing or have done, and they didn't do necessarily a good job of preempting the question in our head, which is, 
wait a second, how are you different from all the other companies that have been doing this or tried to do this? And so, you know, don't be afraid to talk about, you know, sort of the failed competition in the past or the current competition, because that's what we're going to ask about. And if we know about a competitor and you're not mentioning it, then we're worried. So okay. preempt this competition thing. Okay. okay. Gang, love, 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 love the, uh, the, the session. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. I'm sorry I got to jump. Thank okay. you so much, Bill, for being with us, and we'll see you next month. Uh, take care of yourself and look forward to having you. All right, so uh, uh, sorry for uh, a little bit confusion, but please answer the question from Matthew. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, so the, uh, the driver app. So we do have drivers, and we have an app for the drivers. So once there is an appointment that's booked, the uh, driver will get notified. Um, right now, we're, we're using a different software. We're, we are building the software in the background, but the, the software you, we're using has... Um, has an open API, so we're kind of mim mimicking that for now. Um, but and then from there, we either have two two drivers driving together, like basically one following each other, so they can get it right back. Or we've also done A/B testing with Uber, and Uber gets very expensive. You're right, like it's crazy. So you send one driver, then Uber him back. It's just insane. For the for about twelve percent uh, less money, you can actually send two drivers. Um, to pick up a vehicle. So that's the way we've been doing it. There's also a uh, a company that is only in the West Coast, unfortunately, but they have, um, we're in the process of get, hiring them. So all the liability falls on them. It's a contract uh, company that would offer us, you know, drivers at a minimum of four hours a day uh, for $30 a driver with vehicles. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Matthew, do you have any other questions so we can wrap it up? Uh, one one last question. Um, what's your expansion plans? You've gone from the Bay Area to now North Carolina. Where Where's the next couple of targets? I mean, Los Angeles would be great. And um, uh, the Austin, Texas area. Yeah, because I think there's probably good. There's a race going on right now. And I don't even know if any of you guys are aware of it right now. But all of you are trying to get into the same little areas so uh it's going to be interesting to see who expands the fastest because mm -hmm. that person is probably going to win um so you know target those big areas get in there as quickly as you can and hopefully you're going to be the one in the lead thank you thank you so much and it's time to wrap it up uh, uh, via past time uh thank you uh dear judges uh, uh and um, uh, so let's uh, wrap this up and uh, uh, before I let judges to finalize this, uh, just a few simple announcements. I've just posted a few links, uh, the link to the app. If you want to have priority to pitch next time, you will please uh, join our matching app. I will see to the next event. The link is right here next week. And those who didn't pitch this week, they will have priority. Just email us at info at goglobal.world. Uh, this is our email here in the chat as well. And um, those who were at the event today, everyone, please share your feedback. You probably received it via email already. And I also added a link today. We want to know how it is and we want to improve the event to make it better and better for all of you, for investors and for the startups. And if there are, if there are any other investors in here and you would like to be judges, uh, reach out to us with the same email and we might also bring you to the stage uh, within, uh, with this uh, credible, great investors. Now, um, Jordan had to leave, uh, uh, and so we have Matthew and uh, Durant. Uh, guys, uh, uh, please, you would be the ones to close today's session. And Matthew, you, would you would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you to everybody who was here and presented. We saw some really, really good uh, companies. We saw some really interesting founders. Um, I think you were probably uh, some of the people here are definitely going to have some success moving forward. Um, so it's a it's great to kind of be part of that and you know we've been doing this for I've been doing this for a couple of months now and I've had a great time every time so we've found some good companies so I'm hoping to kind of keep it up all right thank you for these great words and we are so grateful for you being with us for this uh, period it was a fantastic time uh Durant uh, you, you your words will be the final ones for today's session 
yeah, I, I suppose I was a bit light today. Uh, people always anticipate me to start start some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at this point, so with, with your with your with your companies, I, I really want you all to figure out how to tell a story, not only about your organization but yourself as well. And I think Matthew was was hitting on this a, a few times. Know a little a little bit about your background very succinctly and how it matched the passion of what you're working on. In addition to that, this valuation thing, like it, everyone understand when you're setting a valuation today. The percentage that we're buying only suggests that if you sell today, we will break even on that particular percentage. So typically, you want to tell a story with your finances that suggests that you're going to be able to get to another round of financing or some type of liquidity event that maximize the valuation that we're going to set today. Now, granted, it's a, it's a it's a risk that we take with entrepreneurs, and I get it, and I love that risk. I'm always going to love that risk, but it would be ideal for you all to communicate that story. With the particular finances, this is why we believe that we're valued at this today. This is where that we think we're going. That that shows us a story and a pathway to a nice liquidity event because we're here to make money as well. But really, the other thing is utilize your two minutes effectively. Sometimes people think that they can just cram everything into the actual two minutes, and really, we just want to know the basics. Who are you? What are you working on? Do you have any initial traction? That traction being your revenues, your intellectual property, which is also going to justify to us. The particular valuation that you that you mentioned.、Uh, overall, great event. Thanks, Daniel, for another event. Thanks, Matthew. I'll, I'll thank Jordan and Bill offline, and thanks to GGW Sharks. See you guys next week. All right. Congratulations to everyone. So my final words is that, guys, please RSVP to the next week event.、Uh, the link here in the chat, and、uh, everyone join the matching app here in the chat as well. It's important. This is how we will match you with other investors and accelerate your access to the people you're looking for. Maybe they will become your investors. And please share any information about the event on your social media. This is how you support us. Remember, I have a lot of effort of my team preparing all this event happening. And any support from you on social media really important to us. We see it, we respect it, and we appreciate that. And so, with that words, I、uh, thanks everyone. Thank you, judges. Thank you, dear startups. You did great today, and congrats. Have a great the rest of the week. Enjoy your weekends. Goodbye. See you next week.